forgotten that sentence. Um, I'm not going to do that. Okay. So I'm going to read through um, this passage and then we'll talk about it. Um, after this, so sometime after Jesus rose again and appeared to his uh, disciples in those first appearances, sometime after that, before he ascended to heaven. We don't know exactly when. Um, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. That's the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and he revealed himself in this way. Uh, Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and two others of his disciples were together. So not everyone was there, but a good smattering of the disciples were there. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of the fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, John, who's writing this, therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, uh, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for the work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging a net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, with fish laid out on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some fish that seem bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, one hundred fifty-three of them. And although they were, there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, "Come and have breakfast." Now none of the disciples dared ask him, "Who are you?" They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus had revealed to the disciples, uh, that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So, um, sometime later, sometime, as I said, after Jesus' resurrection and before his ascension, he meets them at the Sea of Galilee. Um, and, and the disciples, and, and it was Peter's idea, and that's not surprising, he was a leader, said, I'm going fishing. And so everybody else was like, okay, we'll go with you. Um, and theologians have called this fishing trip anything from commendable to condemnable. Like, it was fine for them to go fishing. They were fishermen to, they're giving up on what Jesus told them to do, to, to spread the gospel throughout the world. Um, so I don't think we can know um, about that, but we do know from Mark 16 that Jesus had told them to return to Galilee, which they did. They obeyed him on that. Um, so this much we know they were commanded to do. Whether the fishing was a way to pass the time until Jesus reappeared, or whether they were giving up on Jesus' mandate for them to go and make disciples, um, uh, is unclear. Uh, what is clear is that the behavior depicted in this chapter in no way resembles how they acted immediately following uh, and for the rest of their lives after Pentecost. Um, after that, they weren't fishers of fish anymore. They were fishers of men. All of them uh, went to make disciples. So here's the background. It's early morning. Uh, it's still night. It's still dark out. And, and I am told by fishermen, I am not a fisherwoman, but my son is, and I am told by people who love to fish that early morning is the best time uh, to fish. So that's when they went out on the Sea of Galilee uh, to fish while it was still dark. Is that symbolic? Is it talking about the darkness in their hearts? I, I don't know. Uh, I don't think that, that really matters. Um, but um, the net is interesting because what we think of is maybe a net on a pole that you, you know, go like this. I mean, this net 
was, uh, or a net that you throw out into the sea. This net was tied to uh, two boats uh, vertically. Okay, so tied to this boat and tied to this boat. And then as a school of fish that would come through, um, they would, and they got caught in the net, they would throw another net over it with lead sinkers uh, and pull the thing up. And that's, a, that's an important detail uh, to remember. Uh, so this wasn't the kind of net that you would cast, that you would throw out. It was, it was tied um, to, in the water, um, tied to the boat. So um, this, kind, this is the kind of net that Peter threw over on the other side because Jesus told him to cast it. But it wasn't a casting net. Um, so, uh, the shallowness of the water, they're very near the shore, uh, and the extravagant number of fish, 153 or something, a bunch of, a bunch of fish, and the unconventional use of the net, uh, all point to the miraculous nature of the catch, um, that it could only have been a miracle for them to catch those fish, especially after not catching anything the entire night. Now, I also want to make note that, that there is a charcoal fire, that Jesus is on the shore and he has made a charcoal fire. That's an unusual term. Uh, in fact, in the, it is only used twice in the Bible. Uh, and this is one of those places. We'll talk more about that. Um, and Peter's behavior is interesting too, right? It says he was stripped for the work. What's that about? Um, and, and it says that he put his garments on and uh, just before he jumped or dove pell-mell into the water. He probably had loosened his outer garment, had some stuff underneath. But uh, and, and before he got into the water, before he jumped out of the boat, he quick tied it up. Because, you know, if you've ever tried to swim in clothes, it's not easy to do, right? It, it, was, it was shallow, so he was probably more walking through the water, but uh, probably didn't want to um, lose his outer outer garment. Um, so uh, John, the thoughtful one, uh, not the impetuous, impetuous one, recognized that it was Jesus. He was the first to recognize it was Jesus. And he stuck around, he stayed in the boat to help fall in, to help haul in the fish. Peter just wanted to get to saw Jesus and he took off. You know what? The way I see John and Peter, they're like best friends, right? But they're complete opposite. You've got this impetuous Peter that runs off at the mouth before thinking. And you've got this sort of introspective, shy guy in, in John. And what I want to tell you, because a lot of people think that it's the outgoing people, it's the, the Mr. Hoods of the world that are leaders. And that's just not true. God can use any personality. Uh, and obviously, he used both John and Peter uh, greatly, um, and they were completely different from one another. And then the other thing that happens here is that, that the... Um, the point of view of, of the story stays in the boat. Why? Because John's in the boat, and he's the narrator. And, and this is something where if, if someone made up this story, would have messed up, would have, would have uh, taken the, the story with Peter. But because the story was being written by John, who stayed in the boat, the, um, the emphasis uh, was, was from the author's point of view, from inside the boat. Um, now, let's talk about this because it says no one dared ask if it, ask if it was Jesus. Did they know it was Jesus? They knew it was Jesus. Why, why does it say that? Um, Jesus may have had a different appearance. Uh, after his resurrection, but we don't know that for sure. And here's here's what I think about this. <clears throat> I agree with D.A. Carson about this verse. This is what D.A. Carson says. Perhaps 
perhaps it's the lack of imaginative historical reconstruction on our part that makes us hesitate to see the compelling power of this interpretation. It requires considerable effort to put ourselves in the places of the first disciples. The disciples had been granted the strongest po possible reasons for believing in Jesus' resurrection, and indeed did so. They knew it was the Lord. But whether because they could see Jesus was not simply resuscitated like Lazarus, but appeared with new powers, or because they were still grappling with the strangeness of a crucified and uh, resurrected Messiah, or because despite the irrefutable power of the evidence presented to the, them, uh, the, resurrection, see, the resurrection seemed strange. They felt considerable unease yet suppressed their question because they knew the only one before them could only be Jesus. I mean, think about this for a minute. You go to a funeral, and then a few days later, you go to Chick-fil-A, and the dude is there, and you know it's him. But are you not going to be like, what are you doing here? Right? They knew he had raised, but it was just all so new for them and also unusual for them. So no one dared ask, is it, is it really you? They know it's the Lord, but they're still hesitant. And this is all still new to them and frankly weird, as it would be uh, for anyone. Um, in 1995, September 16, 1995, I gave birth to Katie. Uh, and my daughter, uh, the middle of my, my three children. Um, and it was a really hard time in my life. In fact, the, um, the early fall through, um, through the end of the year was probably the hardest time in my life. Um, and if I would have been honest to someone, um, if they asked me, do you want a boy or a girl? Every time I was pregnant and they asked me that, I said, I just want this baby. I lost my first one. And so, and they'd always say, yeah, as long as it's healthy. And I'm like, no, no, no. I just want this one. Um, and so that gave me a different perspective. And, I, and with Josh, I didn't care if I had a boy or girl. I just wanted to be here. Um, but with Katie, it was a little bit different. If I would, would, would be uh, honest with someone, I'd say, I, I want a little girl. Actually, if I could have special ordered a little girl um, or, or a child, I would have said, I want a blonde-haired, blue-eyed um, a girl with a sparkling personality. Katie is my order to child. She is exactly my child. But the main reason I wanted a little girl was because in, in, in August of that year, my brother in law died very unexpectedly of a heart attack. And my in laws now had lost two of their own three children their daughter to suicide and their son older son to an apparent heart attack. Um, and so I really wanted a girl for my for not just for myself but for my mother. So we went to the hospital and I'll spare you the details. I uh, had a C-section with Josh. They let me labor for a little while but it wasn't working well. And so I ended up with a C-section with Katie. Now I won't go into the details but they don't let you see what's going on which is a good thing. So there's this sheet up, and so you don't know anything. Now, this is where, and I know we only have a few girls here, uh, this is where I plead with the young women to not find out the sex of the baby. We didn't with any of our children. Now, I'm not a planner, I'm like, and I like surprises, um, but here's the thing, there is nothing like that in my life. I saw a thing, um, my son showed me a thing on TikTok, where it said, um, Old school uh, gender reveal. And it's this modern day couple that are in the delivery room and uh, and they see their baby for the first time. And there's just nothing like that. I don't care what you throw in the air, pink, blue, or cake, or whatever it is, there's nothing like meeting that baby. There's nothing like hearing it's a boy or it's a girl. And when Katie came out and he said it's a girl, we exploded. Um, because we were, you know, both so excited to have this little girl. And I kept saying, 
No, it's a girl. No, I can't. Is it really a girl? I can't believe it's a girl. And and finally, my doctor came over and, and he was holding Kate, holding her up like this. And, and he held her up for me and he said, Amy, we don't know everything, but we do know that this is a girl. And, and uh, I knew she was a girl. I didn't think that Dr. Seamers was just trying to, you know, lie to me or kid me or whatever. But I was just so overjoyed that it was fantastic to me and so almost unbelievable. And I think that's where the disciples are. Um, this, is, this is still to them um, just life-changing um, uh, an event of Jesus' resurrection. Um, so um, then just as, as he did uh, in the upper room, Jesus is again serving his disciples. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, uh, hang on, I think I started this too late. Yeah, I started this too late. I'm sorry. Um, no? No? I don't, yeah. Okay, yeah, we're good. Uh, he said to them a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So, um, this is an interesting um, conversation. And what I've written here is that it's the restoration of Peter. The setting for this conversation is it's in front of the disciples. It's a public conversation. Peter's denial of Jesus three times had been public knowledge. John probably heard it at the time. Uh, and so Jesus wanted Peter's restoration to himself and to ministry to be likewise a public event. He wanted all of the disciples who knew that Jesus denied him three times. He wanted all of those men to know that he was now being fully restored to ministry and to leadership by Jesus himself. Um, so let's, let's, um, uh, yeah, I'll read this one. Uh, but physical courage, this is speaking of Peter, physical courage was not enough that night, the night when he denied Jesus. And it was Peter also, spirit willing but flesh weak, who publicly disowned the Lord. Whatever potential for future service Peter had, therefore, depended not only on forgiveness from Jesus, but also reinstatement amongst the disciples. So obviously he's been forgiven by Jesus, and, and Jesus intends to say to the disciples, look, he's still, a leader. He's still one of your leaders. Um, he, I'm not kicking him to the curb. And it's a solemn setting. I mean, he uses Peter's full name. It's a very formal address. Each time he says, Simon, son of John, you love me. In our parlance, it's kind of like when you hear your entire name, first, middle, and last name. That doesn't happen very often. There's really only two times that you hear your full name at graduation and when you're in trouble. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, we named Josh, Joshua Martin Kiesel. And um, Martin was my father's name. And the only time I heard that name coming out of my mouth was when he was in trouble. Joshua Martin Kieser. So when you go to name your children, be very careful if you give them a middle name of, say, your wonderful, uh, saintly father whom you adore, because the only time you're going to hear that name, and my father's name is Martin, is when 
you're you're angry at the little bugger, right? And and uh, you're you're going to hear those words. In fact, I did that with my children, and, and I did that with Lane so much. Lane is Lane Allen Huser. Um, he thought that everyone's little name was Lane. So when he got angry at his sister, he would say, Katie Allen Keezer. Um, and one time, at least one time, he got angry at me and he said, Mommy Allen Keezer. So um, yeah, be careful with that middle name. So Jesus says, do you love me more than these? What are the these? Do you love me more than who? Do you love me more than what? Uh, to what or whom is Jesus referring? Do you love me more than the the boats and the fish? That's possible. Do you love me more than your career, in other words? Maybe. Do you love me more than these men uh, with whom you're working? Maybe. Jesus could be asking Peter to make a choice. Um, does he want to continue fishing with friends, or is he willing to accept God's call of ministry? on his life. But I think there's a third choice, and, and, I, and I like this one the best. Do you love me more than these other men love me? Um, now, keep Peter's zeal in mind. Even though everyone falls away, I'll follow you. I will follow you to death. And then he denies them. Three times. Peter certainly claimed to love Jesus more than anyone else. And so in this case, Jesus may be asking Peter to examine his own faith commitment. Peter had been a man who was very confident in his own ability um, to live for Christ, to be strong um, and remain faithful to Christ. But now he realizes he's not as strong as he thought. So Jesus is graciously, Jesus is not angry. Jesus is graciously giving Peter the opportunity Trust in him, as well as in God's strength, rather than his own ability. I am so glad that we can lean on God and Jesus and his strength, and we don't have to lean out of our own strength. Because sometimes he calls us to hard things. And I'm thankful that he, he helps us. So what Jesus is doing here is he is affirming Peter. Um, it began when he asked him to bring the fish to shore, and Peter jumped to the side. Why? Because he was a leader, and Jesus knew it. The miraculous catch may have symbolized the disciples as, as fishers of men, but Jesus is going to change the metaphor. Um, just as uh, Jesus was a shepherd and the disciples um, or the sheep, Jesus is calling Peter to be a shepherd for those who will come to him. So he asked them, do you love me? Uh, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, Peter, Simon, uh, or said to Peter, Simon, son of John, John, do you love me more than these? Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said again to him, uh, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Uh, and uh, John, uh, he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So we, we see this, um, do you love me? I heard a whole sermon on this one. Um, and, and it was talking about um, the words that Jesus uses in here. The first two times that Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He's using the word agapeo, which is God's love. It's unconditional love, agape love. And then Peter answers, Yes, Lord, I love you, but he uses the word phileo, which is brotherly love. 
And so this pastor that gave this sermon said that Jesus is saying, uh, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter's answering, yes, Lord, I like you. Um, and that in the end then, on the third time, Jesus says, Peter, do you phileo me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I phileo you. And so what the pastor said is that Jesus had to lower his expectations of Jesus um, and, and, and ask him to phileo him. But if he is fully restoring Jesus to be one of the leaders of Christianity, I don't think that can be the case. Um, and, and there's a number of reasons why um, I don't agree with that interpretation. Um, it, is, it is upsetting to, to Peter, for sure. But here's what I think is, is happening. I think that, that interpretation is problematic for several reasons. So with all of the authority I have for, in my bachelor's degree in social studies education and physical education, I'm going to tell you what I think about this, um, this conversation. First of all, the conversation took place in Aramaic, but it was written, it was recorded in Greek. So who knows if such nuances for the word love were part of the Aramaic conversation. Second, John often changes up words using synonyms just to break up the monotony. You've been taught to do that, right, in English class. Don't use the same word over and over again. Put your words around. Use more interesting words. Um, and, and that could be part of it, too. And although those the words are used differently today, phileo and agapeo, it is, it's hard to say if there was such a fine distinction, distinction between them in the first century. In fact, the church brought the, the, the word agapeo into much greater use. Agape love is the love of God. And then also, Peter says, yes, do you love me? And the first thing out of his word is, out of his mouth is, yes. So he's agreeing with Jesus. Yes, I love you. It isn't that he wasn't agreeing with Jesus, because if he would have, he would have said, no, I don't love you. So Peter here is acknowledging and accepting that he loves Jesus, even if John uses a different word. Uh, and then further, Jesus accepts Peter's declaration. He doesn't rebuke him. What do you mean you just like me? In fact, Jesus commissions Peter to ministry. Obviously, Peter's profession of love is enough for Jesus. So I think he's saying, do you love me? And Peter's saying, yes, Lord, I love you. And he says, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. And then he says, do you love me? And Peter is grieved that he's asking the third time, says, yes, Lord, you know everything. I love you. So I think it's best to see the words agapeo and phileo as ostensibly synonyms in this passage. The focus of the converse, uh, conversation is Jesus is restoring Peter and commissioning him to tend his flock. Uh, and Peter is upset, but only because he asked him three times. Um, Jesus asks three times, however, because Peter denied him. And he wanted to give Peter the opportunity to affirm his faith in Christ. So the same Peter who not too long ago had publicly denied Jesus three times while standing over a charcoal fire in the courtyard of the high priest now stands, stands with his Lord the true high priest, in front of another church, and is publicly and fully restored. God is good. Um, now Jesus is going to give him some unsettling news. He says this. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show. This he said to show by what kind of death Peter was going to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, "Follow me." So they're walking along the beach, 
and and Jesus says truly truly or I tell you the truth and he's he, that 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 phrase is reserved for his most important saying so Peter knows whatever comes next it's important and Jesus is going to tell Peter a very hard thing that he will be martyred in fact that he will be crucified for his faith and that crucifixion will glorify God Um, and in the Gospel of John, that idea of glorification consistently referred to Jesus' death in those terms. That, that the death of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus glorified God. And now Jesus tells Peter that his death will also bring glory to God. And, and how do they know it's crucifixion? Because that term, um, stretch out your hands, was a euphemism for crucifixion. It's a way of saying um, and, and and they will dress you. That might be they will bind you. Um, maybe he would be fastened to the cross with ropes. We don't know. They did both nails and ropes, so we don't know. What church history tells us, and we can't know for sure if this is true, that that uh, when it came time for him, he what he was crucified. He did die by crucifixion. But he did not believe he was worthy to die in the same way as his Lord, and so he asked to be crucified. Um, I don't know if he if that upside down part is true, but I do know that he that that what Jesus said actually. Um, and so um, Jesus had said to them, "You can't," said to Peter, "You can't follow me now, but you will follow me." And now Jesus is telling what those words meant. Follow me means so much more than taking a walk down the beach. Uh, it's a call to consistent, lifelong discipleship. Not just a call to Peter, but a call to all of us to walk with Jesus. And Peter will follow Jesus to a cross of his own. And that Peter uh, labored and, and served Christ faithfully for three decades with this knowledge hanging over his head, amazes. He knew from the get-go he was going to die, and he didn't know when. And he kept serving God. Um, but it's also a testimony to the power of the Holy Spirit living within him. Yes? Okay. Uh, so watch the rest of this. On, on YouTube. There might be a part two. We might have to get this done. So there might be a part two. Part two. Chat. You going to watch it run? Or? Oh, okay. Um, I'm just, I'm just going to decide not to do Um. <laughs> Um, so, uh, what about John? Let's see what he says to, about John. Uh, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. So, so John is lagging behind them. Uh, the one who also had leaned back against Jesus during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, when Peter saw John, he looks back and he sees John. He said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? If I'm going to get crucified, what's going to happen to him? Now, I don't know if he's saying, is he going to get crucified too? Or please tell me he's not going to get crucified. I don't know which one it is, but he wants to know about, about John. Uh, and Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? So what Jesus is saying is, look, if, if he doesn't ever die, if, I, if he lives until I come back, if he lives to the second coming, what is that to you? You follow me. It's your walk with me. It's not anyone else's walk with me. God doesn't have grandchildren. You may have parents that are Christians. You may have grandparents that are Christians. Their walk with Jesus or lack of is yours and no one else's. And that's what he's saying uh, to Peter. 
so Jesus is telling uh, Peter what those those words meant. Follow follow me means so much more um, than um, uh, than just saying that you're following Jesus. So um, so Peter's attitude it's hard to tell. It's impossible to tell. Okay, I'll pick up Peter. Um, I will do this uh, the rest of this lecture, and it will be on. Okay.